Hi everyone, it is great to be here. Hi COAP, it is great to be here virtually with you in this 166 year old young institution. I'm gonna talk about limitless global impact, one product launch at a time. But before we dive in, I wanna quickly introduce myself. My name is Sandeep Kamath, and I have been fortunate to have worked in global technology companies based in California for over the past two decades. My last three stints have been with these three companies. I worked with Motorola, which became Google, and we launched Android smartphones. I worked with Mozilla on their Firefox OS platform, and currently I work with HP on their advanced computing solutions. In the past two decades, I had a chance to visit over 20 countries and I worked and lived in four different countries. During my personal and professional journey, I saw the kind of positive impact technology has on human life. And that kept me going. During my career, I had a chance to work on some products that were incredibly successful and some that I worked on did not have, you know, make a great success. However, in each of those cases, I learned a great deal. And as I can see, a lot of you in the audience uh, will go and change the world with your own products one day. So today I'm gonna to talk about three lessons I learned in my journey of launching global products. So let's start. Let me start with a story. The day was June 29th, 2007. I and my colleagues in Motorola's California offices were watching a product launch by Apple. It was widely rumored prior to that event that Apple might launch their first smartphone that year. And as Steve Jobs took the uh, stage and started talking, we were a bit skeptical about Apple pulling this off. Motorola, who had essentially invented the cell phone, was ruling the world at that time with our Razer phone. We knew everything there is to making cool phones. Razer, this beautifully designed phone, became an instant hit. This was a fantastic innovation, not only to pack a lot of tech in that small package, but to invent materials, antenna, industrial design, and the supply chain to make this all possible. Prior to that, we only had bulky phones that people used to attach to their belts. This phone was so thin that now they could put them in their pockets, and it was such a big hit that it went on to sell 130 million units, even at a very high price point of $500 at that point. It was so thin that for the first time, we had broken the technology barrier of 10 millimeter thickness. The soccer sensation at that time, David Beckham was our brand ambassador. And to draw home the sharpness of the phone, the ads showed him literally with a bandaid on his face like the razor cut him. With razor, we invented the term pocketability of phones. Our competition was chasing us with many copies of razor hitting the market, but not succeeding yet. Moreover, we had surveyed thousands of customers. We knew exactly what they wanted. We knew how to handle the network operators who had their own requirements. And that is why we were watching Steve Jobs talk. Unexpectedly, he took a dig at us by showing one of our own smartphones behind him. He went on to say something like, why do companies waste a lot of space by adding a keypad when you can use a touch screen? Well, we knew the reason. The technology just wasn't there yet. At the very least, we knew the touch screens consumed a lot of battery. Users would need to change their, you know, charge their phones every day when they were used to charging only on weekends during days, during those days. Now, at launch, the iPhone did not have many leading features or apps, but what it did have was a fantastic design and innovations like pinch and zoom, apps like music, email, and browsing. Now, for the features it did have, it was indeed a 10 times, you know, 10x improvement or what was in the market at that point. Steve Jobs famously didn't care about user surveys or he didn't care about the network operator's requirements either. He essentially asked them which one of them wanted to you know, launch this phone on their network as is. For a long time here in the US and across the industry, network operators were worried that no one would use all that bandwidth that this new generation at that point called 3G was offering. They were all looking for that killer app that will use that bandwidth. And the iPhone proved that there was no killer app that was going to, you know, unleash all that bandwidth usage, but all that the world needed was the killer user interface. Now, it's been a while, fast forward a decade later, 
and now that iPhone is a leading smartphone of today, and now we are even running out of 4G bandwidth with 5G right around the corner with a lot, lot of these smartphones. Eventually, we at Motorola and Verizon, a network company here, and an up and company, uh, you know, up and coming young search company called Google, uh, teamed up to launch competition to iPhone with our new smartphone called Droid. And eventually, that gave the birth and momentum to a new platform called Android, which grew globally even bigger than the iPhone ecosystem. And Motorola became eventually part of Google, the company that we were teaming up early on. However, during those days, I learned an important lesson as an engineering lead and as a product manager. And that is my lesson number one for today. Do not listen to your users. Do not listen to your customers, right? especially when you're launching something that is 10 times better, 10x better than what is available today. Do your homework, build it, and just go ahead and launch. Why? Users simply don't know. When Henry Ford launched his first car, user surveys were asking for faster horses. People were breeding faster horses and lighter cars so they can go faster. When Google Maps launched with uh, phone-based GPS, Users were asking for concise map books and customized travel routes. Users cannot imagine new technologies. It's not even their job. It is the product managers and engineers' sacred job and you know, fulfilling duty to imagine the future by pushing the limits of technology and making the world a better place, one product at a time. I'm going to share a couple more lessons with you that I learned along the way. And for, for a while now, I've been a technology product manager. What is a product manager, right? Many of you um, might have seen this meme. Product manager is, is really one of the most misunderstood roles in the industry, and this meme is actually resonates. Some people think you are literally shipping products, like in a shipping department. My mom thinks I'm Steve Jobs. Uh, some think I'm studying industry reports all day, Whereas in my mind, I'm a superhero, of course, right? In reality, though, I'm just running like a chicken with its head cut off. And jokes apart, this is a very critical role in today's tech companies. One that lives at the intersection of technology, business, and user experience or UX. You study the limits of technology. You study the user's unmet needs. What are they looking for? And you imagine the best product experience that is out there that will delightfully solve their problems. So let me move to my second story. After Motorola and Google, I joined Mozilla uh, to help build their Firefox OS platform. It was a platform just like Android, but with web-based open source technologies with a focus on user privacy and choice. It is well proven now that the internet has the power to transform people's lives and improve the economic condition of entire countries. We have seen that. Though people were accessing the internet via smartphones, beginning to do that at that time, uh, over half the world's population was still unconnected. They could not afford these phones. Uh, things have improved, but still that's been a problem. So we set out to make smartphones affordable. After launching many phones around the world, we set our goals even higher on building the world's first $25 smartphone. At that time, most smartphones were priced over $150 at the least. Now, sitting in Silicon Valley, we immediately got to work, you know, rolled up our sleeves and dived in. A talented group of product managers, engineers, and open source volunteers started imagining what features a smartphone like this should have. This will be used, you know, by the next billion people in countries like India, Brazil and elsewhere. One idea was let's build something that consumes as little data as possible since these users cannot afford it. And as you can imagine, this was years before Geo changed the landscape. Another idea was to limit the apps they can use since the idea is to save money. And there were at least a dozen ideas along the lines of you know, saving money, saving battery, saving memory or something else. Uh, of course, again, to remind you, this was much before Geo and other networks came along and reduced the prices. So eventually, we decided to visit India as a team, immerse ourselves in local culture, 
observe and talk to these users. So this is our team, our global team in 2014 visiting India, I think around Jaipur and Delhi. And by this time I had lived over 15 years outside India. It was surreal for me to not only look at India from this lens. I, when I was there, smartphones were not on the scene yet. But to sit and talk with these regular people about technology, I had never done that. With the help of a local agency, we sat with street hawkers, housemaids, and you know, uh, small store owners in North India. And this was the user segment we had never talked to. It was an eye-opening experience for us. We uncovered some amazing stories and insights. Some users wanted to buy their smartphone for getting better access to information, a better way to do business, better way to educate their children, better way to keep in touch with family, uh, with WhatsApp. Uh, there were some heart-wrenching stories as well. I remember one day our local translator did not show up, so I was the translator. And a lady started crying during the interview and said, her husband keeps spending their life savings for kids' education on expensive smartphones. Why? Because some Bollywood stars were endorsing them. This was a tough experience for me to translate, of course, uh, to my colleagues. When we asked them to list their you know, top reasons for going for a smartphone, they didn't mention data saving, money saving, power saving that we were thinking, right? They mentioned a few things that, um, like, they wanted dual SIM. They wanted FM radio. They wanted, uh, you know, FM radio was kind of like only means for many people's entertainment. They wanted flashlight because when electricity goes out, they can still get by. They wanted, of course, WhatsApp, like the top requirement. Everybody wanted WhatsApp. Uh, and it was clear to us that we would not have had even an idea sitting in Silicon Valley what people really wanted in India and Brazil and other parts of the world. We had to go there, we had to experience it. And you know, eventually a company called KaiOS uh, took this vision forward and they launched uh, what came to be known as a geophone now in India. And that phone where it truly brought the internet to the next billion people and things have been changing ever since. Now that brings me to my second lesson, right? Which is exactly opposite of the first lesson. Listen to your users listen to your customers when you are building something that clearly solves an existing pain point or an existing gap talk to them they know the best in some cases just observe them using the you know existing products and you can uncover a lot of unmet needs that is how the world's best companies uncover some insights and there was a lot of learning for me personally to go through that process several times now, since the major audience here is engineering students, for my third lesson, let me bring it to my uh, somewhat deeply personal story. As students of technology, as you embark on your careers, it is important to realize what your why is, what your sense of purpose is, like this quote says, right? There, there will always be some big choices you will make in life. One of them is your career, and that choice, the choice of your career, makes you think about your impact on the society at large. For a long time, personally, for me, I just didn't know what my why was, right? I didn't know my why myself. Now, I'm an engineer son of a doctor dad and a teacher mom. In my family, we have always had fun conversations about the relative societal contribution of each of our professions, right? At times, I've thought to myself that for sure, you know, engineers solve problems, but doctors and teachers are crucial respectively for society's physical and mental health, if you, if you will. Now, what happened in the world in the past 18 months, and I'm praying for India and for the world, for the pandemic, but the global pandemic, that gave me an entirely new perspective. Every single profession in their own capacity had to work to the best of their abilities to keep the world humming and running, somehow, whichever means. Although, Without a doubt, doctors and frontline workers and teachers sacrifice the most, no doubt about it. They work the hardest. It is difficult to imagine how things would have looked without the technological progress of the past decade. Many population had to rely on mobile phones, computers, internet-enabled retail, e-commerce, telemedicine, you know, remote work, and even 
uh, vaccine related collaborations that saved our lives and are saving lives right now. Technology played a big role in controlling the devastating impact such a global pandemic would have had in absence of these tech enablers. So I'm really fortunate to have worked from 2G cell phones to today's 5G smartphones, apps, IoT, and speech assistants. But for many years, all of this tech work honestly felt like just a lot of hard work to create the, you know, just the next tech toy. Somebody's going to play this game or this cool phone. For the first time, it felt truly worthwhile. We were able to save lives and from keeping life from coming to a complete standstill. I felt finally I had found my purpose. Now that brings me to my third and final lesson for today. Find your sense of purpose. Think for yourself what impact you want to have on the world. Make sure it aligns with your passion, of course. Make sure there is value created for the world, just like the Japanese philosophy of Ikigai says, to make the world a little bit better today than yesterday. The technological progress since I graduated over 25 years ago has been phenomenal. And we have been you know, lucky to be part of this. It is only accelerating as the world stands at the cusp of many new revolutionary technologies. Things are accelerating, especially in India. The world's largest democracy is also the world's largest pool of well-connected, well-grounded talent, I should say, like you guys. Now, all of us started with ABCD in school, right? Today, A stands for AI, and you know, B stands for Bitcoin, C stands for cloud. I know I'm doing this tongue in cheek. D, data, and E, edge computing, and FG stands for 5G. But jokes apart, this is you know, an enormous power in your hands as the shapers of these technologies and the movers of the world. How will you use that power? How will you decide when? and when not to listen to your users and customers. And most importantly, how will you go about finding your own why? What is your sense of purpose? Now, as I conclude my talk here, I want to go back where I started. And here is to all of you making your own limitless global impact with your products, one at a time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.